from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. Good evening. My name is Monica Norton. I'm the deputy local editor for the Washington Post. We've been a charter sponsor of the National Book Festival, and this is the 15th year that the Library of Congress has hosted this event. Uh, for those of you who are very able to uh, work on social media, I'm here to tell you that we're using the hashtag NatBookFest15 if you'd like to tweet along or follow along as we proceed through all of this. And there's also an app this year, can be found at loc.gov backslash apps. Before the documentary Dark Girls had screened or before it had even been seen by the general public, it seems to me that there had been dozens of articles about the film. And in every one, I'm pretty sure the words controversy or controversial were appeared. Dark Girls, the documentary, and the book talk about what is frequently taboo within the black community, the hierarchy attached to skin color. There is much outrage when a white critic describes Viola Davis, Davis as older, darker, and not classically beautiful. What is often less talked about is when those things are said within the black community. In this book, Sheila P. Moses takes us into the intimate look at how dark-skinned black women of varying shades have been taught to internalize the prejudice of others. It is at, time it is at times devastating to read this book when you think about that a lot of these things that are coming from people are coming from family members and friends. You better be smart, girl, because men don't like dark women. My favorite, you are so pretty for a dark girl. <laughs> but what Miss Moses does is take us on a journey of self-love. The women in this book, the stories that she recounts, leads them to the realization that they're not just beautiful for a dark girl, that they're just beautiful. A National Book Award and NAACP nominee for The Legend of Buddy Bush, Ms. Moses is, current, is also the author of Callous on My Soul, a memoir with Dick Gregory, and most recently, the young adult novel, The Sitting Up. Ladies and gentlemen, Sheila P. Moses. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much for that warm introduction. All lives matter. Black lives matter. All lives matter. It's wonderful to be at the National Book Festival again. This is my fourth invitation. I start, 2006 was my first um, invitation to come here. And it's just wonderful to see the people here, the young people um, bringing their children out. And um, I thank the National Book Festival, the Library of Congress, Candy, um, thank you all for um, having me here again. Most of the time, I'm here to read from one of my books for young adults. This year, I'm here um, reading from the book Dark Girls. Many of you saw Dark Girls on Oprah's Network last year. And I watched Dark Girls, and I listened to the women and Bill Duke has been a friend of mine for the last 25 years. And no, he's not my husband. I know on the internet I'm his wife. I'm not Bill's wife. Um, but Bill and I have been friends for a long time. And I called him, and I'm, I call him William. I said, William, you know, this really should be a book. And he said, oh, God, here you go again, you and your ideas. I said, no. This really should be a book because there are women um, that are on this show talking about their dark skin. And OWN Network will show this one or two times, um, maybe, and it'll go away. But if you do a book, women can put it on the coffee table. And for generations to come, they can pass this book on to their children. So that is how Dark Girls was born. And most of my books are about my family, my life, on Rehoboth Road in Rick Square, North Carolina. And I always felt I had a little control because those are my folks. And what they said, I knew and I understood. But Dark Girls was different because I was talking to celebrity women, teachers, just women from all walks of life, but what they had in common was that pain of not being cute enough because of their beautiful dark skin. 
So this book was really pushing me to a place that I really didn't want to go. I called Bill a couple of times and said, I lost my mind when I called you because this is really something. It was something to talk to people who really were trying to love themselves and couldn't for a very long time. But Cheryl Lee Ralph, oh, I love that Cheryl Lee Ralph. Cheryl said, what other folks think of me really in my business. <laughs> I really thought that was wonderful. But this is what Cheryl Lee Ralph had to say. Being a dog girl has never bothered me. It never will. I am a Jamaican woman, and where I came from, black is truly beautiful. My native people say it, and they mean it. I am grateful for that. And I was reminded of how beautiful black really is when I went home a few years ago. And I had an encounter with a little Jamaican girl. She was walking with her mother when she spotted me on the street. She stopped. She looked at me with her youthful eyes, with disappointment. Mama, she is not as dark as I thought she was. <laughs> And that really made me smile, made me happy. Happy because I wasn't dark enough for that baby. How about that? <laughs> I was so proud at that moment. Proud that her small, that that small child was happy, happy to be a dog girl. And every time I think about Cheryl, um, and I can see that um, moment, I can see the little girl walking down the street she was confident, confident, born with confidence. I know that for sure because my mother and father put that same power in my soul. They told me I was beautiful all my life and so did my brothers. So that is what I will always believe. And then again, she, again, she goes on to say, and um, what other people think of me as a dark girl just is not my business. And I, I love that. That was probably my favorite quote in the book. But Cheryl, in the book, um, you know, many books have typos. They say it Haitian. She's actually Jamaican. Um, and Cheryl is from Jamaica, where black is really considered beautiful. And then let's go all the way to Clinton, um, North Carolina, to Cynthia Banks and her story that is as far away from Cheryl's story as a young girl as the East from the West. And Cheryl's story is, I'm sorry, Cynthia Banks' story, who Cynthia is a makeup artist. My mother was light enough to pass for white. She gave birth to three light-skinned children and one dark-skinned me. She was so kind and so good the best mother in the world. My mother went out of her way to protect me from people who cared that I was darker than her other children. She knew before I did that the world would be unkind to me. Thank God I was too young to remember the, the day she was in the five and dime store and a white woman walked up to her and said, what are you doing with that little black baby? I always wondered which aisle my mother left her southern manners on when she gave that woman a piece of her mind. <laughs> southern white women were not the only people that had been unkind to my dark skin. I was a grown woman living in New York when I started dating a brother who I thought really liked me. We were walking down Fifth Avenue one night when he stopped and looked at me. He said, you're so beautiful and smart if only you were light-skinned, you would have the world. My heart still hurts for him. That was our last date. <laughs> I love the dark skin that I'm in. It is because of that dark skin that I do have the world. And that's Cynthia Banks. And, and that story is really interesting because I, I know Cynthia very well and I, um, know the people in that area, and that's not just Cynthia's story. That's probably thousands of Southern women, um, that's their story. 
And, and I pick women from different um, parts of the world to read their stories so that when we do the Q&A, we can talk about some of these women. Um, and because geographics have a lot to do with this book. Um, th this one is really interesting. This young lady, um, Lucretia Jones, she lives in Philadelphia now. She's an attorney there, a very successful attorney. She ran for judge last year. She didn't win, but she put up a dog girl fight that you wouldn't believe. <laughs> Um, and, and I love her. Um, we call her Kiki. I, um, she's a, a wonderful young lady, but I love her story because she's from St. Louis, Missouri, and it's a, a Midwest story. Back in my native town of St. Louis, Missouri, my maternity, maternal grandmother gave birth to 12 children. Most, most of them were very light and what people call, with what people call straight hair. I am the oldest of 26 grandchildren, and like my father and his family, I came into this world with dark skin. My mother, who is one of, the, of my grandmother's lighter children, and my father both showered me with love and affection, which sustains me to this day. My mother's siblings and her parents treated me like a little princess and assured me that I would grow up to be a queen. They told me that I was bright and beautiful. After the children at school brought to my attention that I was dark, my family continued to make me feel like a pretty little dark girl. Forty years later, those same great women make me feel like I am a pretty woman. They provide me with the unshakable, and I love that word, unshakable belief in my talent and my beauty. I am such a proud dark girl. My skin color did not make me who I am. Those women did. So I thought her story was really incredible because her, her mother really um, is a very light woman. Her grandmother and her great-grandmother who died at 97 um, back in June. Um, and the love that they pass on to her is five generations of them. And she talks about that. Of course, a lot of what people told me is not in the book. And a lot of what they told me was very important. But, you know, editors at HarperCollins and any um, editor will remove information when it comes down to the size of the book. But some of the most important things that the women had to say, you know, we could not put in the book. And one of the things she had to say that was very important is that she went off to school and I think second grade, her mother was dropping her off at school and the kids would say, that's not your mother. That white woman is not your mother. And it did not, she, after she talked to her mother about it a couple of times, she continued to just press on, even as a young child. And like Shirley Ralph, what other people thought of her, in her mind, it was just none of her business. And what I wanted to say about all of the dark girls in this book is that we come from a long, 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 long line of great women, darkest night, like my grandmother. My grandmother, Babe Jones, was as dark as night. And she married a tall, handsome, good-looking Braxton Jones, who was as white as snow with straight hair. And, I mean, he, but he was African-American. And I, was, I always found that interesting because where I come from in little North Carolina, light-skinned men didn't marry dark-skinned women. What was really interesting is she could not read nor write. She signed her name with an X. And he could read and write and was self-employed. So I said, that was a bad dog girl. <laughs> Because she hooked that brother. I don't know. <laughs> and I always found that very interesting. And I wish that they had lived, that he had lived long enough for me to know more about him. Because what I thought was really incredible about him, that he could have passed for white. And he married a sister, a real sister, with short, nappy hair. And I look at my mother, there's only two of them living now, but I look at her sisters and brothers, they were every shade in the rainbow. And my grandfather was not afraid to marry that sister. But I think what at the end of the day with all of my books, what that really is saying to me 
is that love conquers all. That the color of our skin, that my tall, light-skinned grandfather, the great Braxton Jones, um, who could read and write, was not afraid to marry a black girl, a, a dark girl, who couldn't read or write. So when I was writing this book, I, I thought about them, and my ancestors came back to me. And every time I would get tired of one of those celebrity women, or I would get tired of them whining about being dark, and then they would call me the next day, and they would say, you know what, I want to change that. I would go back to the hope of the road, and I think about the great Babe Jones and how proud she was to be a dark girl. My grandmother was so cool. When my grandfather died, he left her land and a house. We call it Jones property, where my mother has a home now. She had her own home in a place that everybody else were pretty much sharecropping and renting from other people. And in that dark skin, she had so much power. She was the only black person on the Hoboth Road with a telephone. So she thought she was it. She had a phone. And she would go to the grocery store on Saturday with her own money, not food stamps. And she would take a chair and these, as she called them, in the white folks' store, and put it in the middle of the floor, and she would make them bring her food to her. I never understood that. <laughs> Miss Babe, you want to see the fish? Yes. But she would not go and look at the fish. They would bring that fish to her. She said, I want that piece, that, and that dark girl would shop from a chair. I never understood. I'm still trying to understand that. <laughs> but what, what, I under, what I do understand is that they had respect for her because they knew that dog girl liked herself. It was the dignity. She couldn't even read the receipt that they gave her. But they knew she had some cash in that bra. That's what they knew. <laughs> And we were as poor as dirt, but my grandmama had some cash in her bra. And they knew it, that, babe, that Braxton Jones had left for her. And I tell that story at the end of Dark Girls. Um, I tell it because she's not a celebrity. She never made it, I'm sure, outside of North Carolina, maybe to Virginia. But she understood who she was. She understood that she was Babe Jones. She understood that she had a man, a good-looking man, that loved her, that left her with something that she could sit in the floor and make people bring catfish to her. <laughs> and, and I think that's powerful. She didn't live in a big, fancy house. She just had a, a comfortable life as a beautiful, dark girl on Little Rehoboth Road, a place in the middle of no place that civilization forgot. So that's what I leave with you about my dark girls. I, I leave with you that we are special, but all women are special. Um, Bill Duke followed up dark girls with light girls because light girls are special too. And one of these days, it won't be long, we're gonna look around and we're gonna forget about color. We're gonna forget about darkness and lightness. And we're gonna be a better um, set of people. We're going to be God's people. That's just what I believe. And again, when I wrote this book, there were times when I was really frustrated. I was frustrated at the dark girls that didn't like themselves. And I was looking for Babe Jones to rise up. <laughs> just rise up in them and love themselves like Cheryl and like Cynthia. And that's what we owe to our ancestors back further than Babe Jones could see, back to that slave woman who didn't have a choice of who she slept with, who she cooked for, where she ate. We owe it to them to be great dark girls, light girls. That's what we owe them. That's my story and I'm sticking to it. <laughs>
Okay. I would be remiss if I didn't read from The Legend of Buddy Bush, if that's all right. Um, the Legend of Buddy Bush, um, I, I, I know I was invited here to read from Dark Girls, but again, I always read um, something from my ancestors because they won't let me sleep at night if I don't. Um, Buddy Bush was a black man in 1947 accused of raping a white woman in my hometown. And my grandmother, Babe Jones, who could not, again, read or write, she tell the story. Oh, Buddy Bush got away from the Klan. We didn't never see him no more. I said, who in the heck is Buddy Bush? <laughs> and over the years, I found out who Buddy Bush was and what his legacy was, that he did get away from the Klan. But I decided to mix Buddy Bush's story with my life story. I decided to make Buddy Bush Babe Jones' nephew, son, what we call him in the South. He was her child. And this is the day that old Buddy Bush arrived on Rehoboth Road. It was a Sunday when my Uncle Buddy arrived. Ma let me stay home from church. My big sister and brother had to usher, so off they went. But me, I stayed home to lay eyes on Buddy Bush for the first time. His car was blue, sky blue, a Cadillac, a new Cadillac. His suit was blue too, dark blue with pinstripes pinstripes, just like Grandpa's Sunday go to meeting suit. I remember standing there holding my breath and my pee. I couldn't leave the front porch. That outhouse was just going to have to wait. Lord, I wouldn't have missed the first sight of my Uncle Buddy for nothing on Rehoboth Road, a city man. He pulled that Cadillac right up to Grandpa's front porch. I looked at his shiny shoes first, and I could see my face in them. I smiled. His eyes, my eyes went slowly up his legs. They looked so long. His jacket had one, two, three, let's see, had six buttons. His shirt was white. His tie was pinstripe, just like his suit. And then I saw his hat. I'll never forget that hat. Oh, yeah, it was blue with a feather to the right. Only a city man could own a hat like that. My grandpa Braxton Jones, he stood right beside me and he never moved, but I stepped to the right. Grandpa waited for Uncle Buddy to walk up to him and he did. Welcome home, son. Oh, it's so good to be home, Daddy Braxton. They hugged and my grandpa, he looked over at the Cadillac. Nice cowboy. Oh, it ain't much. My grandma, I'm sorry, my mama ran on the front porch. Ain't much, bruh. Ain't never seen a car that fancy. Hey, sister. He smiled a big smile at Ma. She ran around his car, and she was rubbing it like it was a genie bottle. Then she jumped in my Uncle Buddy's arms like she wanted nothing but a rag doll. Hey, bruh. Now, that only left my grandma, Babe Jones, to walk my Uncle Buddy home. Come on in this house, boy. I've been keeping your breakfast warm all morning. We all followed my Uncle Buddy inside. I saw my grandma crying for the very first time when she hugged her only boy, the one that ain't even blood kin. We ate, we laughed, we had a time. We were a family. Thank you. So those are the stories of my ancestors and people of today in Dark Girls. Um, and I, um, I bring them here with me today to share their stories. But I also want to know your stories and why you're here today. Um, so at this point, we can open for Q&A. Thank you for listening. <laughs> Thank you.
questions? Yes, sir. Good evening. Marty? Good evening. Marty, right? Yes. See, I'm not as old as you thought I was. <laughs> Marty. Good evening again. Good evening. I just wanted to ask if you could talk about uh, Baron Claiborne and how he was selected as the photographer for the book. Baron Claiborne um, is a wonderful, wonderful photographer. Believe it or not, like illustrators, most authors don't select the photographers, and the photographers don't select the authors. Harper Collins um, selected Baron Claiborne, but it was definitely not a mistake. For me, when I see a picture, it has to tell a story. If you read my books and you can't see the people, then I'm not doing my job. So Baron made these dog girls walk off these pages. So that's how he was selected, and I'm very proud of the work that he did for us. Yes. Yes, sir. I always hate these things. Um, could you, thank you very much for your remarks today. I'm not a, a dark girl, although I know a good many of them. Um, <laughs> Some of my best friends are dark, in fact. So. Okay. Could you look at the uh, controversy about the lack of dark colored women on most periodicals, monthlies, uh, weeklies, uh, that sort of thing? And thanks. Uh, I'm sorry, I need your question again. Uh, the lack of, uh, of diversity in the, color, of, of brown women fronting major magazine uh, coverage. The lack of. of. <sighs> Not they can't find any, of course. <laughs> well, you know. I'm 54, and I, it's okay to stay in your lane. I don't know the answer to that. I don't know the answer to that. What I do know for sure is when they put a dark girl on the cover, that dark girl, I will not call her name, allows them several to lighten their skin. So some of this is not their fault. Now, I, I don't know all the answers, but I know that some of this, we have to stand up and say, I'm on the cover and I like my dark skin. I've been asked this question before, my dear, um, by several people, and then I say, I stay in my lane and I don't know the answer. But I know when we have the opportunity, let's stay dark. Okay, when, and mainly when you have the power when I know they send it to your publicist and you have the power to say, don't lighten my skin. Now, some of you are mad that I said that, but that's the truth. That, that really is the truth. So I don't know when we're gonna be on the covers that we belong on, but I know when we have the opportunity, let's grab it and, and make it our magazine that month. Is that a bad answer? Okay, I'm sorry. Yes, dear. Yes, um, as a so-called grandma's baby that okay. was raised by an 82-year-old and fabulous mm -hmm. grandma from New Bern, North Carolina, no, I, I just you... want to um, thank you for sharing your experience there uh, because when you were describing the experiences of these other women who were mm -hmm. raised uh, by, uh, especially in the South, by uh, African American women who were perceived as white, which was quite common according to my grandmother. Yes. And basically, your description brought back many stories that she had told of supportive women in her family. Uh, mm -hmm. One in particular, my aunt, Rit, who was named Catherine. Um, and essentially how, although Aunt Rit could have passed for a white woman, how she supported and nurtured and loved my grandmother and her sisters who were dark girls during a time in the South, uh, in North Carolina particularly, where that wasn't such a good thing. So I don't have a question. I just wanted to thank you for sort of bringing back that memory and giving me something good to share with Grandma when I get back home. Tell Grandma hello, and I know where New Bern is. <laughs> Thank you so much. I have another question behind me. Actually, no, I'm, I'm going to tag team with that. I just want to say thank you for your remarks. I'm from Durham, and I grew up with that. Well, you're pretty for a dark girl, so I would walk away when guys would say that, but I'm with the... Nice well, you're guy. just pretty. Period. Oh, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> and I wanted to just add, I have my Christmas gifts, your books this year. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry.
Okay. Hello. Hi, my name is Sabina. Uh, I just have a comment and mostly um, I grew up in Brooklyn, New York. My mother's from Canada. When I was a teenager, she used to say things like, you know, look in, the, in a magazine and say, oh, she's pretty for a black girl. And it didn't mm. strike me till years later mm. when I had moved away from New York and I was, I was living here, um, that well, that's not really a nice thing to say. Oh. <laughs> you know, I mean, people are people. Whether you're black or you're white, everyone's mm. pretty. Everyone's got their mm. own different way of looking. Um, and then I was listening to a radio station here and they talked about the lack of diversity on um, news, news broad, broadcasting, you know, TV news, mm -hmm. that <clears throat> you'll, you'll see very light-skinned black people, white, you know, like men and women, and you mm -hmm. won't see many dark-skinned. Yes. And it woke me up to like, you know, this really is happening. And it's not just that, it's, it's, it's sports broadcasting, it's all of it. Mm. And it yes. just really, it really woke me up and really made me aware. Thank you. Yes. And that's what we have to be is aware and acknowledge that we are aware. Thank you. That's a great comment. Thank you, dear. Yes. Yes, dear. Hi. Hi, my name is Afifa. Um, my question, I guess it's something that I want you to comment on. And it's a combination of some of the questions or comments we've had in the past like five minutes. So. As you were talking about your, fam your family and your ancestors, and as well as the people who you wrote about in your book, or you, you sort of pulled information from in your book, for me, there was a, a line, of, a continuous sort of line of things that contributed, contributed to why these women felt that they were, wh how they, they were able to feel pretty and, you know, as, as, for, you know, as dark skinned women. Like the issue, for being, you know, they didn't have an issue with it. And so for me, it was love that they received from their parents. It was a strong foundation of their ancestors, as well as being told often that they were pr pretty, that they were beautiful, that they were smart. Not only pretty and beautiful, but smart. And I wonder how will young women, very, you know, women who are, in their 20s now, or women who will be in their 20s in about 10 years, with the influence of media and how we don't see dark-skinned women in media, um, dark-skinned women being portrayed as attractive women in media, how will, will that, how do you think that will impact on young women? Um, and how important do you think that is? So if you have the fam, if, let's say women, you know, they don't have that strong foundation. They don't have people telling them you're beautiful, you're smart, and at the same time, you have the media telling them, well, you, you know, we're not really gonna portray you for whatever reason. And I'd like to know what you think about that. How do you think, how, what will happen to that group of women? Well, I think what's in, important is that we all need a little Babe Jones in us. You know, that we, we don't, we don't really, my grandmother outlived my grandfather probably 20 years. So it was not his validation that made her feel good about her. It was something inside of her. That old Southern song, I cannot sing. People always think I can sing. My voice is horrible. But there's an old Southern song, there's something inside of me. You know that song? Something inside of me. There just has to be something inside of you. It is not on ETV. It's not on Entertainment Tonight. It is not on Atlanta Housewives. Jesus, it is not. <laughs> it has to be something inside of you that tells you to go ahead. It has to be something inside of you. It has to be something inside of you. See, I'm a brown girl. Until I wrote this book, I, I really didn't get it. I have a light-skinned sister, brown-skinned brother is beautiful and dark as night. And then it hit me that I'm a brown girl, that I'm in between, that I'd never had those issues. It never crossed my mind. 
So there's, you know, but it, it was something inside of me that said, I'm going to make it anyhow. And I, I don't know your answer because it, it's, it's going to have to come from inside. I don't know what a mother can tell her daughter today. And then she go to school the next day and only the light-skinned girl with the long hair is getting attention. Everything you tell them at home, they go, you might go to school the next day and it's reversed. And that's not their fault. So the answer is you're going to have to dig deep, deep, deep down inside. And whatever that thing is, and we all have a thing inside of us, you're going to have to pull it out and you're going to have to fight. You don't have to fight. You don't have to be an actress. You can fight to be a great teacher. I love teachers. You don't have to be a great teacher, a great librarian, a great doctor, a great lawyer. You're just going to have to know that it's inside of you that it's your birthright to be great. I, I don't know if I answered you. Yeah. It's inside of you. Maybe you had to do something. Y'all want to fix my life. But it's, it's go, you know, but you have to fix it inside of you. Yeah. Yes, dear. Thank you. Why are you um, crying? Why are you sitting there? I saw you over there crying. Are yeah. you just in love? What was uh, yeah. I was cold. <laughs> you were cold. Okay. Okay. I'm in love. And you're in love. I'm in love you come, I mean, okay, see? I will never have uh, okay. this. <laughs> Ayana, fix her life. You were supposed to say, I'm in love. I'm, okay. I am in love. <laughs> okay. <laughs> With a light skinned brother. I'm sorry. With a light skin. <laughs> um, so, <laughs> quick comment and then a question. You okay. know, take to, for everyone to remember back in 2007 when Barack Obama first came on the screen. And we said, okay, that's an okay brother. And then Michelle came up. Yeah. And just oh, that. I, I we, can't even get And it that out. is Go when ahead. we really collectively <laughs> yes. said, okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Um, but my question is, how did the publisher react when you said you wanted to write this book? Did you get support? Were they skeptical of whether there was interest in the book? And was it an uphill battle? Or because the documentary had already been done, they were more receptive to it? Oh, absolutely, because the big O had already signed on. <laughs> you know, so it, again, you know, validation. It was okay, you know, Bill Duke is a legend. Oprah, the big O signed on. And a blessing, we had a beautiful dark girl editor who understood the journey. The, the fabulous Tracy Sherrod, she was wonderful. But she's also a, a dark girl, so she got it. There was no sale, she understood. And that was just a God's little wink. Yes, yes sir. Uh, thank you for uh, speaking to us and sharing your time. And uh, I want to say that I, I saw Dark Girls, the movie, even before it was on uh, the OWN channel because there was a showing of it here in Washington at the Warner Theater. Mm -hmm. And I'm startled at what I heard in the movie because that's not something that's open in my experience and my background mm -hmm. where I grew up with people who accepted everyone in their, in their uh, color, and it wasn't until I was an adult that I saw and heard people express these kinds of attitudes mm -hmm. and was shocked to hear them. But one thing that comes across very vividly from Dark Girls and from the stories that you've told us here is that a lot of people face or are confronted by this, not from the outside, but from family. Oh, absolutely. And that's, I guess that's my, where my question is, where, where I kind of struggle with this is that I didn't have this in my family. And why is it that family, more so than the media, more so than nosy neighbors, more so than uh, snippy white people saying, what are you doing with a baby? Why is it that family? Where are you from, my dear? I'm from Baltimore. Okay. Well, you answer your own question. Oh. You can work. <laughs> You're from Baltimore. I think a part of that is, thank you, that's a good question. Um, I think a part of that is a, is a Southern thing, um, but I think it goes all the way back to slavery. The light, you know, the light-skinned people were allowed to work in the house and the dark-skinned people were forced to work in 
the fields and the dark-skinned people began to resent the light-skinned people. And that's not our fault. Um, but to answer your question, yes, in families, we, in my own family, I'm sure families across the world, not just the South, but sometimes um, we tend to, it's not just color, but we're harder on our own family members sometimes than the outside world. I think Cynthia said it best that the, in this book that the lady in the store was not the only person that was unkind to her dark skin. You know, um, one of the ladies, um, Candy, remember when we were at the signing earlier, she was talking about, is she here? The young lady with the beautiful gray eyes, is she here? Um, she was from West Virginia. And she was talking about how her sisters and brothers um, really favored her lighter skinned sisters and brothers. She didn't say the neighbor, she didn't say the white lady at the store. She said her sisters and brothers favored the lighter sisters and brothers. So for me, um, a lot of times people you know, ask questions and authors try to just give a direct answer and I'm quick to say, you know, that's out of my lane. I don't know the answer, but for that question, what I believe is that it goes all the way back to slavery and just the master, you know, turning the dark skinned slaves against the light skinned woman in the kitchen who's the mother of his five children. Okay, well, but that's another book. <laughs> that's definitely another book. So today as we wrap up Dark Girls, do we have any more questions? We are running out of time. Any more questions? So, so what I, I say to you from my great, 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 great grandmother, I don't know where she came from, but I know where Bay Jones came from and I sat at her table on, in the queen's chair and I know who my grandfather is and I know that I have a great mother who left something inside of me. So that's what I leave with you today. Dark girls, light girls, black lives matter, all lives matter. We are humans with dark skins and light skin and different shades that we can beat all of this with one simple word, love. Thank you. This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.